Hi, everyone. This is a video on inductive reasoning, and it's based partly on chapter 13 from Bradley H. Dowden's Logical Reasoning, which is a textbook that he has generously shared online. And so I will leave a link to it below in the description. So let's begin talking about induction by first reviewing deduction. What is a deductive argument? Well, a deductive argument is one in which the arguer intends for the conclusion to be absolutely certain, to follow with logical certainty, logical necessity from the premises, such as in this case. Number one, all men are mortal. Number two, Socrates is a man. Number three, Therefore, Socrates is mortal. So number three, the conclusion follows from the first two premises. In other words, if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true. So this is a level of confidence or certainty that we can only have with a deductive argument. And philosophers love these kinds of arguments. You find these arguments also in mathematics, but they're fairly rare in life in general. And so that's why we need something else. And we call those inductive arguments. So an inductive argument is one in which the arguer intends for the conclusion to follow with a high probability. And if they're successful, then we say it's a strong inductive argument. In other words, in that case, the premises or the evidence supports the conclusion with a high probability. Uh, if they're not successful, then we have a weak one. We say that the evidence doesn't support the conclusion. Here are some examples. These, these come from the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Number one, every time I've walked by that dog, it hasn't tried to bite me. So the next time I walk by that dog, it won't try to bite me. So this is a conclusion based on past experience, and we do this all the time in life. Um, but it doesn't mean that uh, we, we won't be wrong, right? We, it, in this case, the dog might actually bite you. That's how life works. But if you've walked by that dog enough times, then you're probably safe to rely on past experience to draw this conclusion. Number two, the police said John committed the murder. So John committed the murder. Well, you can see that this argument is, is weaker. Um, it's just based on one accusation. And especially when you compare it to this next example, uh, you can see how it's this next example is stronger. Number two, sorry, number three, two independent witnesses claim John committed the murder. John's fingerprints are on the murder weapon. John confessed to the crime. And so John committed the murder. So a much stronger case for John being the murderer. Dowden uh, discusses one type of induction called inductive generalization. It's also known as an enumerative induction. And this just means generalizing from a sample. Dowden suggests that in order to get a representative sample for an inductive generalization, it is important to follow these four strategies. Number one, pick a random sample. Number two, pick a large sample, although that might be difficult, especially really large samples. Number three, pick a diverse sample. So make sure your sample is representative of the diversity of the population. You're not just picking or sampling from one part of the population. And pick a stratified sample. So this is the strategy of intentionally selecting from certain segments of the society in order to hopefully find a representative sample. Why do we want a representative sample? And why does following these four strategies make it more likely that our sample will be representative? Well, just to answer the first question, why do we want a representative sample? If you wanted a conclusion that is not going to be uh, subject to doubt, right? You want to be uh, certain about your conclusion, then you want to make sure that your sample it. Uh, the sample of the population that the population that you're trying to draw conclusions on is representative. And so let's just make sure we have some other concepts clear here. A hasty generalization is when you generalize too quickly. You haven't either followed the steps above or you're just jumping to conclusions about the population. Now the population is defined as the target group. That's who you're trying to draw conclusions about. And so uh, whether it can be a, a, a group of people, it can be objects or animals or anything. The sample is the subset of that population that you are gonna use to draw those conclusions about that population. And then finally, a so-called self-selecting participant is one that volunteers to be interviewed or a research subject, uh, but self-selecting participation is not 
necessarily a very representative way. It's a non-representative way of, of um, testing or generalizing. So be careful with that or watch for that. Now let's consider an example from the book. And so I'm asking you here to identify the sample, identify the population and discuss the quality of the sampling method and other problems here. Dowden says, uh, in this case, voluntary tests of 25,000 drivers throughout the United States showed that 25% of them use some drug while driving and that 85% use no drugs at all while driving. The conclusion was that 25% of US drivers do use drugs while driving, a remarkable conclusion. The tests were taken at random times of the day at randomly selected freeway restaurants. So just really quickly, aside from the fact that 25% and 85% don't add up to 100%, you've already got a problem there, right? We can ask why, was, why were only freeway drivers selected? Why only at free, freeway restaurants, right? So we can ask that. And additionally, I think we need to clarify what we mean by drug. Are, are we, do we mean caffeine? because surely that would be consumed in large quantities at freeway restaurants. And so that might inflate the, uh, the findings of this study. There are other problems too as well, and I'll let you figure those out. Okay, so let's talk about a variety of inductive arguments. Other types of inductive arguments include argument from authority. When you say that, say, uh, scientists conclude this about this disease or this vaccine. Um, so we can also conclude uh, that based on the fact that the scientists say so. So that's an argument from authority. It's inductive, meaning that the conclusion may, is not guaranteed. But if these authorities are true authorities and they know what they're talking about, it's a good argument. Now, uh, I've mentioned in previous lecture that there's something called uh, a, appeal to authority. So this is a, a fallacy uh, of, of an appeal to an improper authority. So when the authority that you're appealing to is either not qualified to give you advice, or so there's some other problem with that authority, authority, then you might be in danger of committing the fallacy here. And again, remember, this is an inductive argument, so the conclusion doesn't follow with necessity. Scientists, a million scientists could still be wrong, but it's, it's based on on the fact that experts are, are usually are, are, are usually reliable if they're talking, if they're speaking about a subject matter in their area of expertise. So next is the argument from analogy. And Dowden says, this is to argue that because two things are similar, what is true of one is also true of the other. In other words, if you have two things that are similar in several respects, then we might conclude that they must also be similar in some additional or some other respect. Here's an example. This is called the argument from design or the teleological argument for the existence of God. And this comes from William Paley in the 18th century. It goes like this. The universe is a complex system like a watch. We wouldn't think that a watch can come about by accident. Something so complicated must have been created by someone. The universe is a lot more complicated, so it must have been created by a being who's a lot more intelligent. <clears throat> so in this case, you've got two things. One of them is a watch, and the other is the universe, and they're being compared. And the author here says they both share the characteristic of being complicated. And so because the watch is complicated and has a designer, a watchmaker, so then the universe being complicated must also have a designer. We'll call that God. So the trouble with arguments from analogy is that if they're not um, str strong analogies, meaning if they don't have enough characteristics in common, then it's hard to draw that final conclusion. In this case, we only have one characteristic mentioned, complication or being complicated. And so that, that's not really enough to make a strong inductive argument. Now, if we can draw, if we can identify further characteristics that watches and universes have in common, then we might be, we might be able to create a stronger inductive argument but because of that a stronger conclusion. Okay, so a faulty analogy is that claiming two things are analogous uh, in one respect when they are, they are not actually analogous. And next we have an induction from past to future. And so an induction from past to future says that it is a reliable principle that the future resembles the past. 
Um, and we can predict the future based on past events. And in the history of philosophy, this principle has been debated. Nevertheless, we find that it's a reliable way. I mean, it's how we operate in life, right? Based on past experience. For example, we can be sh pretty sure that the sun will rise in the morning. And this is based on past experience. Every day of our life, we, the sun has risen in the morning. So it's very, very, very likely that the sun will rise tomorrow morning. Might it not happen? Certainly, it might not happen. The sun might go supernova. It might, whatever you can imagine. But then, of course, we won't be here to witness that. Next, appeal to typical example. This is a type of an, arg an argument by analogy where all members of a class resemble the single example in some relevant respect. So consider a pineapple or some other fruit. You've tasted, maybe you've tasted one of that group, one of that, that fruit, the pine, one, one example of a pineapple and you didn't like it. And so you conclude, well, I must not like pineapples. Okay, so maybe that's a good form, maybe that's good inductive reasoning, but it also could be a weak inductive argument because just again, selecting one and basing your judgment on that one um, might be wrong because perhaps you got one that wasn't ripe or some other, there was some other problem with it. The argument based on signs is um, using signs to draw conclusions. For example, there are dark clouds on the horizon and so there must be a storm coming. Dark clouds often do mean that a storm is coming, but not always. So that's an inductive argument, can be weak or strong. A causal inference, uh, we'll go ahead and skip that one. Uh, inference to the best explanation is a form of inductive reasoning, Dowden says, in which we reason from premises about a state of affairs to the best explanation of or for that state of affairs. And we have uh, two terms we should define here, the explanandum and the explanands. And the explanandum is that which needs explaining and the explanands is that explanation, that which does the explaining. So how do we know when we have a best explanation or a better explanation? Well, we need to ask a few questions when we have uh, multiple possibilities here. Which theory relies on fewer assumption, assumptions? Which theory makes more successful predictions? And which theory fits the facts? Okay, I think I'm going to stop there. And if you found this video helpful, please hit the like button down below.